Uh, so my name is Jeremy Newman. I'm the policy director with the Texas Homeschool Coalition. Um, and before you leave, when you get to that back table back there, you will find a yellow sheet of paper and a blue sheet of paper, paper on the back corner, um, both of which have information on them about a bill we're pushing called the Tim Tebow Bill. Um, one of them is uh, sort of an FAQ explanation document, and one of them is a bill analysis of it. Um, so that bill, if you look it up right now on the Texas Legislature's website, um, you will see that the names on that bill right now is it's filed by Representative Harold Dutton, and it's been joint authored by Representatives Leach, Frank, and Vialba. Um, so if you know, if you follow names very much, then you'll know that's a pretty broad spread of support. Um, and so the issue that we're working on um, with the Tim Tebow bill is that right now in about 30 other states in America, it is legal for a homeschool student to participate in extracurricular activities in the school district that they live in and that the tax dollars are paying for. But in Texas, it's not legal. So in, especially in rural areas of Texas, um, homeschool parents frequently find themselves in situations where they either have to choose between giving their child athletic opportunity or academic opportunity. And our point is that you shouldn't have to make that choice, especially not if your tax dollars are already paying for the facilities that you're not allowed to use. And so um, what we've done with the bill is we've crafted it um, in conjunction with some su um, suggestions that UIL made um, in such a fashion that it, it upholds the no pass, no play rule um, that applies to public schoolers as closely as possible as we can for homeschoolers. So a homeschool student would be required to um, achieve a passing grade on a national standardized test for com com competition in the first six weeks of the school year. And after that first six weeks, um, all of their grades that, or their, their parent provides written, written verification that their ongoing grades are passing and that they are therefore eligible to continue in UIL participation. That's a bill that we've been working on for the last three sessions now. Um, and it actually made it all the way through the Senate last session, came over to the House and died in the House Public Education Committee um, because Chairman Jimmy Don Acock of the Public Education Committee decided he didn't want to let the bill out. Um, which was actually after he had told us all session long up to that point that he was in favor of the bill. Um, so we definitely have an obstacle in that sense since um, Jim Donnacock is back as chairman this session. Um, we expect to be able to get that bill all the way through the Senate without any significant trouble, um, especially since Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick as chairman last session was one of the ones who pushed the bill out of um, the committee. So. We have um, presented or will be presenting a committee substitute to the language that you'll find on the state's website, um, which is almost identical to the language we passed out of the Senate last session. It has a couple small changes and it removes the sunset provision that we had to stick on there last session in order to get it through. Um, so that's one of the big issues that we've been working on because homeschoolers across the state have, they frequently have to come down to that choice of providing their child only one type of opportunity where if you participate in a homeschool league, you don't have access to the same scholarship opportunities that a public schooler might have. And the only difference is that you chose one form of education over the other form of education, but you're both paying for it. So our position is you shouldn't have to make that choice when you're already paying for the service that you're not allowed to use. One of the other bills that we're working on is called the Texas Parental Rights Restoration Act. So THSC, um, Texas Homeschool Coalition, actually deals with more issues than just homeschooling. We deal with parental rights issues from a broader perspective, and so you'll find us on issues of parental rights from a medical standpoint, in particular from a CPS standpoint during the session, um, a pretty broad range of issues. One of the bills that we're pushing is a bill that I just mentioned, Texas Parental Rights Restoration Act, and it's amending a section of the family code called the Grandparents Access Statute. Currently, the Grandparents Access Statute in Texas allows for the mother or father-in-law of a single parent to sue that single parent for access to or possession of their child. And they can receive that possession for an undefined period of time without having to prove that the parent is even an unfit parent. So case law provides that a parent has, a fit parent has a presumption that they are acting in the best interest of their child. And although the intent of the law does not violate that case law, the application of the law absolutely violates the case law. Because what typically happens is that if a grandparent, who will almost always have more money than the single parent, if they can find the right attorney and the right judge, they can find a judge who will remove the child for an undefined period of time because under temporary orders in the family code, there is no expiration date on a temporary order once you've issued it which means that once they get the child out of the home temporarily, they can keep the child temporarily for three or four or five years at a time 
without ever having to prove that the parent is actually an unfit parent and should not be allowed to raise their own child. Um, we've had situations in the past where parents had their ch children removed for three or four years without even, not just proof, not even an accusation against the parent that they were an unfit parent. And so our position is that, especially when it comes to single parents, your right to direct the care and control and upbringing of your child should not be dependent on how much money you have to defend it. So that's something that we've been pushing for the last three or four sessions. And the main opposition that we've had to that is a group called the Family Law Foundation. So if you ask Tim Lambert, who's the president of THSC, what he'll tell you is that uh, the first session, the Family Law Foundation ignored us. The second session, they were mad at us. And by the third session, well, now they want to work with us. And that's because we've systematically killed their bill every single session, which does basically the opposite of what we're talking about, where it expands the current statute um, to apply to any family in the state of Texas, and it removes almost all practical evidentiary requirements that the grandparents would have to meet in order to prove that the parent is unfit. And so what we've done with the bill, and we're actually presenting uh, language changes to it shortly um, in order to clarify some of the, the issues in it, but what we've done with the bill is we've provided a, for a requirement that the grandparents, when they file the suit, they have to present to the court an affidavit that outlines all of the facts upon which they're asking for access or possession. So they don't have to necessarily prove all of those facts at the initiation of the case, but at the initiation of the case, they do have to present the affidavit stating what the facts are. And then within 60 days, as is outlined in the current language, they have to be able to come back and prove all of those facts to the court. Because what typically happens is the grandparents will file the suit and they'll get a temporary order and then they go on a fishing expedition trying to find evidence that they can dig up against the parent to justify the case that they have already filed. And so our position was that if you don't have the evidence, you shouldn't be filing the case. You shouldn't be allowed to create the evidence to justify the actions that you have already taken. And so that's part of one of the other issues that we're working on during the session. Uh, I mentioned that you'll find us on various other issues. Um, immunizations actually is one of the issues that we're looking at this session because there are several bills that have come up about that. Um, you'll find a bill, I can't remember who the author of it is, but you'll find a bill that um, is changing the immunizations registry in the state from an opt-in system to an opt-out system, which means that everyone is automatically grandfathered into the immunization, immunization registry and anyone who doesn't want to be in has to know that they have to opt out. So from a practical perspective, if you think about that and dissect it, the only reason you want to make that switch is if you're going to try and catch all the people into a net who don't already know that they should be paying attention to it. Because everyone who wants to be in and is aware of it is already going to be in. So we get into that from a parental rights perspective on the grounds that a parent should be able to decide their whether their child's medical information is public in the public registry or whether it's not public. So when I say that we get involved in things from a parental rights perspective, understand that that's a very broad sweeping net. And so if there are issues that come up during the session that you guys identify as a parental rights issue, we always appreciate knowing about that. And then as a, a brief um, issue on our parental rights bill, um, we are looking for parental rights attorneys who would be interested in testifying in favor of that bill. If you guys know anyone who is a, a family law expert um, who would be interested in testifying in favor of that from a conservative perspective, um, then that's something we would appreciate. Last session, if you look at the testimony from last session um, in the House Jurisprudence Committee, we had a joint hearing between our bill and Representative Symphony Thompson's bill, which was the Foundation's bill, which did the opposite of it. And if you go look at the testimony from it, you will find that every single person who testified against um, Symphony Thompson's bill and in favor of our bill were the parents who were being affected by the situations. And all the people who testified in favor of Symphony Thompson's bill and against our bill were the family law attorneys who make all of the money off of the cases that the parents are stuck in. So that's kind of the issue that we have there, um, is that the, the, the attorneys have they're the ones who make all of the money, so they're not typically the type of people who want those cases to go away. So those are the type of people who we're looking for as the family law attorneys who are interested in looking at this from a, a due process justice perspective, a conservative perspective. So those are all of the issues that um, we're working on so far, and I'll reiterate, you can find information on the Tim Tebow bill back here at this table. Um, and if nobody has any questions, then I think I'm done. What's the yeah. house bill for the parental rights? Um, the House bill is 524. It's carried by Representative Cindy Burkett. Um, the Senate bill is 414.
That's carried by Representative Don uh, Senator Donna Campbell. And I think we're done.